Shalom Aleichem, my dear friends, dear everyone. The parasha of this coming Shabbat is Parashat Vayeshev, in which the very popular story of Yosef, the righteous, the son of Yaakov, and everything that ensued after, uh, after the fact, of, of course, we know the tragedy that befell our father Jacob after he, he thought that he can enjoy a little bit of tranquility after everything that happened to him with Esav and Lavan and other things. But now the tragedy of Yosef is, was a real catastrophe for him. And as everybody knows, here is how what happened. Yosef was the youngest of all his brothers. But apparently, according to the Torah, his father loved him very much. Uh, of course, there is a great distinction that from this we understand, of course, that the brothers, the other brothers, the children of Leah, and uh, also the maid servants, Bilha and Zilpa, most of the tribes, Ten tribes came from Leah and her maids. So, Yaakov gave much more distinction to his favorite son. Yaakov ahabet Yosef mikol banav ve'asa lo ketonet pasim. Yaakov made a special shirt of silk, a beautiful shirt, for him for Yosef. That was seen by the brothers, and the brothers felt jealousy. Of course, when there, when, whenever there is jealousy, in, at its beginning, one must take care of that. You feel jealousy, let's say your friend, a good friend of yours, who was equal to you all the time, and suddenly he became a millionaire. It's almost unavoidable that his friend is going to feel a certain kind of jealousy. Now, if you don't take care of that beginning of jealousy, it's going to grow, to become practical hatred. That's what happens with jealousy. Jealousy is the worst, the worst kind of trait of character. And one must take care of it in the very beginning. These are the words of Rabbi Avigdor Miller. I remember he used to tell us, whenever you feel jealous of someone, try to exhibit. Immediately get up. For example, your friend has become very rich. Exhibit your joy about it, that you're very happy. Go and tell him, I'm so happy for you. Yes, it's true. It's a, it's a lie. Nevertheless, it's a good lie. Why? The Mesilat Yesharim, the Ramchal, Alava Shalom, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, he writes in his book, Mesilat Yesharim, The Path of the Just. He writes there that the external awakens the internal. Let's say in your heart there is jealousy, take care of it by outside, externally, Show that you're happy for your friend, because it might help. It might just help you to get rid of this kind of jealousy. Otherwise, it's going to become hatred. That was the mistake of the brothers. They were jealous of Yosef. But in the beginning, they didn't say anything. The problem is that Yosef, since he doesn't know what's going on, he was very naive. So one day he dreamt, and he came to his, to, he, he, he spoke to his brothers, all of them, and to his father. But by, by the time his mother was already dead. And he tells them that, I, that he, he's dreaming that the sun and the moon and 11 stars are going to come and bow to him. What does it mean? 
The brothers immediately understood that their brother Yosef is practically having some kind of ambitions. That's why he's dreaming. And his ambition is that one day we shall come and be enslaved to him, that he will become our king. They felt a tremendous feeling of jealousy that be begins hatred to the point that even his father, Yaakov, who was like a prophet, he hollered at him. And he said to him, You want me and your mother and your, your brothers to come and bow to you? But the Torah says, Ve'aviv shamar et hadavar. And his father kept it in his heart, which means he understood that this is a dream of prophecy and it is going to be to happen. When? So he kept it in his heart. He anticipated the possibility that Yosef will become a king. But he would not say that to the brothers. That's why he, in front of them, he had to be angry at them to mitigate, to attenuate whatever bad feelings the brother had. It didn't help. But Yosef is very naive. One day, Yaakov, his, his father, is asking him to go to look for his brothers and to see if, if they are okay, if all the herd of all everything that they are taking care of, if everything is okay. So he went to look for them. He walked very, very much, and he said, and until he found someone, and he asked him, where are my brothers? He said to him, in Dotan. So he went to Dotan, not knowing what's coming to, but they saw him from far away. And they said, Hine ba'al halomot al-lazeba. They start already, to laugh at him, about him. And they said, here is the guy, the dreamer is coming. Let us gather and kill him, murder him, and we shall take his blood and bring it upon some kind of, uh, of his shirt and bring it to his father and to tell him that a wild beast has uh, killed him. When Yosef came, they held him and now they sat down and ate as though nothing happened. Something that one cannot understand. It's unbelievable. We know that the brothers of Yosef, 10 tribes, we know that the, the great people, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehudai, Sachar, Zebulun, Binyamin, Dan, Venaftali, Gad, Asher, our fathers, they were very righteous. They were the children of Yaakov. How is it possible to expect such a thing from the best kind of people. Our sages said that Yaakov Avinu became the choicest of all the fathers, of the great forefathers. Why? Because he, he brought about the, he, the, the birth of, uh, of, of, of all the, those righteous people who are going to become the heads of the Jewish people. We don't understand this. They took Yosef and they plotted to practically murder him until Reuven says, you know what, put him, I mean, throw him inside the, the, the pit and there, don't worry, we'll, we'll take care of him after that. What he had in mind is perhaps he can come back from after his services with his father, he will come back and take uh, his brother again and bring him back to his father. But in the meantime, they decided to kill him Right? Reuven is not here. But suddenly Yehuda got up and he said, why should we contaminate ourselves with his blood? Let us sell him, rather. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelite. And they decided to sell him there. And the Ishmaelite, they sold him also to the Midianite, who went to Egypt, and they sold Yosef to Potiphar, one of the ministers of Paro. And that, that's how it, that, and then Reuven, he came back and he found that the pit is empty and he started to cry and he tore 
his garments, knowing that he cannot bring him back to his father. When they came to the father and they told him, Chaya ra'a achalatu, a wild beast killed him. And, you, and Yaakov says, Tarof toraf Yosef. His son was killed with a, by, a, by, by a, a wild beast. And he mourned for him incessantly. Unlike every mourner who mourns for, uh, for his uh, close relative uh, for 12 months, he mourned for him for years and years. He didn't want to get any kind of solace and comfort. We have to understand why is it, how is it possible to understand that people who are considered very righteous in the eyes of our sages and the Torah, that they should behave in such a way to take their own brother first, to murder him, and at least to sell him to become a slave to the worst kind of country, Mitzrayim at the time? Unbelievable. The Rambam says, the Rambam in a, in Ilkhot De'ot, uh, chapter 6, he says, he himself says, Kol echad mi Israel, if, if one uh, hates his brother Jew, whoever he is, then he is uh, transgressing the law, the negative commandment, Lo bil One is not allowed to hate any of his uh, uh, Jewish brothers. Not even in his heart. How much more when you, you pass to the practice of try, even trying to kill or doing some kind of damage? As I said before, jealousy, when it begins, take care of it. Otherwise, it's going to become hatred and there is no solution. The only solution is to take care of jealousy from the very beginning. And only the Rambam is giving us the answer to the question, how is it possible that those brothers have committed such a crime? And he says, because there is a rule, that's how he writes in Orachayim, chapter uh, uh, 606, Tafresh Vav. And he says that because they judged Yosef as a motzi shemra, as a person who's, who's, who's spreading bad rumors against them, and anybody who, who destroys your reputation, you are allowed not to forgive him, in a way. Okay, unless if he comes back and he's asking for your forgiveness. Anyway, that's something, that's an issue that I will not tackle halachically now. Whatever, whatever answer you can give to this is not enough. It's impossible that people like the tribes of Israel, the children of Jacob, the eye of the Jewish people can commit such a crime. There is only one way that can give us some kind of uh, understanding. That was the will of God. It was the plan of God, the plan of Hashem. Only the ways of God are always in the natural way. That's why he had to go to, 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 to start the whole thing with a kind of jealousy, and the jealousy became of hatred, and they took him and they judged him as though he is destroying their reputation. He goes to his father and he tells them, and he tells him that they are committing this and that uh, sin, as the Talmud tells us. Nevertheless, all this is not satisfactory. There is only one thing that will satisfy our mind. The will of Hashem. That's the, the plan of God. God said, I have to have my nation. My nation has to be special. To be special, they have to have also humility and uh, all the good things. And that's what happened. That's why I have no choice, God says. I have to put them to be slaves in Egypt for a long time, 400 years. He has already told this prophecy to Abraham. From the very beginning, our father Abraham knew because God told him, I want you to know, Abraham, that your descendants are going to be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. 
You should know that. Yadoa teda. Why? Because God has to be has to do His plans according to he, to nature, the nature that He created, and nature requires all this story to happen this way. And that's why Yosef had to be captured by his brothers and to be sold to the, to Egypt to the, to Potiphar, because from the house of Potiphar there is going to be a gradual story that will happen. The wife of Potiphar is going to fall in love with him and to try to seduce him. But Yosef is a God-fearing person. He objects. No, he says, I cannot. Your husband has given me everything in my hands. I am the ruler of his house. I cannot do this against him. And she would come back again and again. Please. She wants to sleep with him. That's what it says. She in me. And Yosef would tell her, no, your husband made me the boss of all his house. I cannot betray him. She came back again and he said, how can I do this? How can I do this kind of evil? And I shall see and I will sin against God. The commentators say that there were here three kinds of trials. First time she came and he told her, I want you to know there is no one higher than me in the house of Potiphar, which means I cannot betray him. That was the first one. The second one, again he said to her, he made me in charge of his house and I will commit this crime. And the third time he said, how can I sin against God? The commentators say that those were three times that in the beginning Yosef was trying to fight with himself. He was seduced. He wanted also. She was the most beautiful. Our sages said that Zuleikha, the wife of Potiphar, was one of the most beautiful women in, on earth. Yosef was definitely attracted to her. But he was fighting with himself three times. The first two times, he used the argument, how can I do this against my master? But it would, it would not help him that much. He almost did it until he remembered, how can I sin against God? That's when he refused totally. And that's when she came and grabbed him. She grabbed him by his coat and he had to fly away and leaving his coat in her hands and that's how she came and she blamed him that she, he is the one who wanted to rape her and they took Yosef they put him in prison several years he was in prison until he heard the dreams of the two ministers of Pharaoh and he was able to interpret their dreams and everything happened according to his interpretation and the guy who, who was given the interpretation that he will become a, again in charge of serving the, the, his master, Pharaoh himself, the king of Egypt, when Pharaoh dreamt about his famous dreams and no one was able to give him a satisfying interpretation, there was this guy finally, two years after he, 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 was, he was liberated from, from the, the dungeon, with Yosef, then he remembered Yosef and he said to Pharaoh, there is somebody who is an expert in interpreting dreams. Can you call him about? And Pharaoh called him, he said, bring him. And they brought Yosef and Yosef interpreted the dreams. And he spoke about the famous, you know, the famous uh, uh, solution that there is going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine that is unequal of any other famine. And he told him that I, he gave him advice. And Paro said to him, there is no one smarter than you. You become the king of Egypt. He became the viceroy. The king himself told him, there is no one who will be greater than you except me with the throne. Otherwise, everything is in your hands. And this is indeed what happened, of course, in the next parashat, parashat Miketz, and culminating with parashat Vaigash. After that, 
after Yosef, after even the brothers of Yosef had to come to Egypt to, to buy food. And that's when they saw Yosef, but they did not remember him. But he remembered them. And he finally, after several times, he divulged his identity to them, telling them, I am Yosef, your brother. And they did not, they could not forgive themselves for what they have done. All this does not make sense. What's going on? How could they do such a thing? But after Yosef became the king of Egypt, we understand this is the plan of God. Because that's going to cause the brothers to come and live with Egypt. Even his own father is going to come to Egypt. Many years he's going to stay in Egypt. Because Yosef is the king there, as he is their son, and he's his son, and, then, and, and he's the brother. After the death of Yosef and the death of all the brothers, many Jews. They were procreating in a way that is miraculous in accordance with the Torah. And the nation of Israel was born. And of course, Pharaoh, the new Pharaoh, and all Egypt did not uh, like that. They, were, they are becoming so numerous that one day they are going to be the, the, the rulers of Egypt. They could not tolerate such a thing. That's why they decided that they should be enslaved. And the Jewish people was put into slavery for 210 years in an excruciating kind of slavery until they cried to the Almighty God and the redemption came through Moshe. We know the rest of the story. And that's how now the, the, the Jewish nation consisting of millions of people, when finally they, with the great redemption as we will read in the next uh, book in Shemot and Baera, Finally, they will end up coming to the, how, to, the, to the mountain of Sinai where they will receive the Torah. Now the nation of God is, is receiving the Torah and the nation of God is in the world. That was the plan of God. The God can sometimes, he will even cause you to sin if this will bring about something that is very important. I want you to understand, I'm going to conclude in a few minutes. We have to understand one thing. From this story we are going to learn that if one does not keep the Torah and the mitzvot and the commandments, he is practically rendering himself open to anything. There is nothing that can stop people who are not religious from committing any kind of, 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 of sin, adultery, uh, stealing, anything. With money, from, because of money, people have done a lot of many, many kinds of, of crimes. Adultery, what's stopping them? They don't believe in God, they don't keep the Torah, they don't keep the commandments, nobody is stopping them. Crime cannot be stopped in any way except if you are religious. When you are religious and you keep the Torah and the mitzvot to the best of your ability, now of course you, everybody has the same desires, if not more, by the religious. Just religious people have also their evil inclination. They have their temptations also. And some of them, a few of them, do commit crimes. But we have to admit that among the religious Population, not many are criminals. Not many. Go to the prison, how many religious people do? You could, you could count them with your own uh, fingers. Only one thing can stop crime. Being religious and following the Torah and being a God-fearing person. There's a story that I read somewhere of somebody who was driving and he, he crossed the street without giving any, he didn't care about the red light or uh, whatever. Of course, a policeman stopped him. He said to him, didn't you see the red light? He said to him, yes, sir, I did see the red light, but I didn't see you. So we understand what is the hint there. 
The hinder if there is nothing, if you have no no reason for which not to commit a crime, you are going to commit a crime. You don't care about red lights. The problem is you, did, you don't see the, you didn't see the, the policeman. Only policemen can stop you. But when a person is a God-fearing person, in most cases, he will not commit a crime. How many people are murderers among, uh, among the religious people? How many people commit adulteries? Yes, we do hear here and there a few stories here and there, but very minimal. But the population at large is what's talking. When you see the majority is not religious, then you know that there is a, every day there is a, another crime and another crime. How many of them come from religious people? So being a God-fearing person is going to stop us, will give us the proper power to not to commit a crime. And if, if one commits some kind of crime, at least there is a possibility of repentance if one does it the proper way. If there is a, God, a fear of God that is really honest in the heart of a person, in 99% of the cases, he will not commit crimes. That's what we learn from the story of Yosef. Yosef, what stopped him from being from, with the wife of Potiphar? He argued with his own logic in many ways. That is true. He was a good man. But ultimately, the only reason why he finally did not commit the crime of adultery is because he remembered God and he said, I, I'm going to sin against the Almighty. How important it is, especially when you are a Jew, to keep the Torah and the mitzvot. Keeping the Torah and the mitzvot and learning how to fear the Almighty is greatly efficient when it comes to commit bad things. Let us conclude with that and pray to the Almighty God that our nation Israel will become a nation that is worshipping the, the Lord and keeping the Torah and the mitzvot. This way we can see the coming of the Redeemer, the Mashiach, and everything will be fine, not only for the Jewish nation, but for all the world, all together. Shabbat Shalom.